Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now, to your host. Hi, I'm Greg Simpson. I'm the Regional Director for the Middle East and North Africa here at SIP. And uh, I'm pleased to be joined with my co-hosts, Autumn Moore and Zoe Watkins. Thanks, Greg. We're excited to be here. Today's episode of Democracy That Delivers is part of the Emerging Leaders series that SIPE is running, featuring SIPE's young, up-and-coming changemakers from around the world. This particular part of the series is pleased also to be able to highlight our women's staff in conjunction with Women's History Month. And so with that in mind, today I have with us Erica Lewis and Sarah Rupert from the Middle East and North Africa team at SIPE. And I'm pleased to be able to take the next half hour or so to hear a little bit more than perhaps I've already known about the two of them and uh, get them to share with you a little bit about what brought them here to SIPE and the work that they do here. Welcome, Erica, Sarah. Thanks all, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. So Sarah, we'll kick it off with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Uh, where did you go to school? And then what, what brought you to SIPE? Sure. So the question, where are you from, is always a fun one for me. My family is currently in the D.C. area, but I grew up moving every couple of years. So first in Ukraine, the Ivory Coast, was also in Pakistan and India before moving to Virginia when I was a sophomore in high school. I attended the University of Virginia, where I studied foreign affairs and French. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to study abroad in Morocco, which really kind of sparked my love and interest in the Middle East, North Africa region. Wow. What uh, what took your family to, to so many uh, exotic locales? My father was a journalist and he actually, he got his start in the Peace Corps in Morocco in the 1980s. So it's now a couple of generations that have been interested in Morocco and the wider Middle East. Yeah. Full circle following in parents' footsteps. Mm-hmm. It's so funny when talking to junior staff at SIPE, I feel like a lot of us do have that uh, history in our families or, or in our backgrounds of international work, right? And, and continuing that on. Erica, did you have a, a similar backstory as well? Not at all. I was raised in the Midwest, so I'm from Indiana. I did move around as a kid, but definitely not internationally like Sarah did. It was more throughout the Midwest. And I've been in Maryland for most of my life. Um, my family's kind of scattered throughout the country, but I've stayed domestic. I went to uh, McDaniel College for my bachelor's degree. I actually started at York College and I played soccer there. So that's a fun fact. But at McDaniel, I studied political science and international relations. I had traveled um, a few times to the Middle East, especially um, Northern Africa um, to Morocco for a few volunteer opportunities. So I've always kind of had an interest in the region and I focused some of my studies at McDaniel on the Middle East in particular. And Erica, do you have to also speak uh, French to be working in this region? I do not. At least you've got the soccer side of it covered. Exactly. <laughs> It's ironic that we have uh, two staff members on the podcast who have spent time in Morocco, where as regional director, it's one of the places, one of the few places in the region that I have not yet been to. So I'm looking forward to both of them showing me around a little bit. But I am curious, Erica and Sarah, both, whether you look back on your time in Morocco differently now that we're working, now that you're working on the country a little bit, and and, uh, does that change uh, how you view Morocco? It definitely does for me. And actually, one fun fact that I don't even know if you know this, Greg, but (laughs) Erica and I have stayed in the same hotel in the same small town in Morocco at different times. But we were we were swapping stories at one point about our time in Morocco. And we had both spent time in this town of Azru, which even if you know Morocco, you're not going to know the town of Azru. And we had both stayed at this Atlas Lion Hotel. So that was kind of a fun coincidence. Small world. (laughs) We were comparing pictures and I was like, wait, that town looks very familiar. Where were you staying? (laughs) And it was, yeah, very small world experience. But to answer, Greg, your question, I do see them differently or I see it differently because when I was in Morocco and the bulk of my time in Morocco was spent in the Peace Corps in southern Morocco in a very small town. That I got to know very intimately well and built a lot of relationships in like a very local place. But then the work that we're doing now is a little bit broader and I'm getting to 
especially in Morocco, we're working in the entire region of Sous Massa rather than just one small town. And we're working on women's economic empowerment, which is something that I saw a lot of a need for while I was in the Peace Corps. But as a Peace Corps volunteer doing youth development work, that was not something that one I specialized in or knew, you know, really anything about. And so one of the things that's been very neat at SIPE is seeing the work that we're doing on women's economic empowerment in Morocco and how that tied into the need that I saw while I was there. I was not in the Peace Corps, but I did go to Morocco for two consecutive summers for a few weeks during each trip with a group called Cross-Cultural Solutions. We worked predominantly in an elementary school for both trips, both summers, doing a variety of different public health initiatives. Also a vision project, was, which was very interesting. We screened a lot of kids who went to the school to make sure if they did have any kind of vision issues that, that those were addressed, because a lot of the times that was an impediment to their ability to actually learn and develop. For instance, like if they can't see the chalkboard, it's very hard to, you know, have learning objectives connect in their minds. So that was one prong of, of my experience in Morocco. And that takes youth to a very different level because youth was, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight year olds, um, not necessarily like, you know, 25 to 40 year olds. And I think specifically the second prong in terms of women's economic empowerment, I had the opportunity to visit several women's co-ops in the region. And I think that that was very interesting. Even at that time, I had noticed that there was a pretty big barrier and women weren't really key players kind of in the economy in Morocco at the time. And, and clearly that's still an issue now. But for instance, I mean, some of the local women were making, you know, a lot of rugs and, and textile items. And it was really kind of stressed to us that a lot of the times they're not able to really take their goods to market per se. And if they are, it's there's a lot of barriers to that. And, you know, any funds generated from their efforts aren't necessarily given to the actual women who are owners of their of their small businesses. So that was eye opening for me for sure. And I think it directly ties to our programming in Morocco now, which is interesting. Yeah, that's right. Because Greg, didn't you poach Erica from the Siwi team from our Center for Women's Economic Empowerment? Zoe poach is a very strong word. <laughs> <laughs> Erica was uh, if I remember correctly, an intern on the Siwi team and we took advantage of the fact that they started her training well and uh, and when we were looking for an assistant and she was looking for her next step uh, it, it it was a good fit well yeah especially we we just recently also talked to some emerging leaders from the seaweed team and they were talking about how they really see their role as being almost like consultants to other regional teams right that they hope to see women's empowerment taken into account in every region, not just in CWE specific projects. Definitely. I think internships are just very valuable generally, especially when you continue on within the same organization that you're interning for. Because, you know, I was really kind of well versed with the site culture already before starting full time, which was great for me because I was able to already have connections built, even when site, you know, when the pandemic hit and Sipe went virtual. So I didn't directly work with the MENA team, but I sat right outside of their offices. So I was familiar with everyone. And I think that really helped me feel more connected pretty quickly when I did start in this role. And we're not quiet. So she heard quite a bit of us and <laughs> pretty well by being in proximity. Very true. <laughs> Back in the day of being in proximity to each other, right? <laughs> I do want to ask the both of you a little bit more about the work that you do, the roles that you play. Sarah is an associate program officer on the Maghreb team. So Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, focusing in particular on a, on a Tunisia project that we are working on that I want to hear a little bit more about. And Erica's role is even more complicated. We'll get to that in a moment. Sarah, tell us a little bit more, though, about the work that you do. Sure. So exactly as you said, I'm working on Maghreb. So that's Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And a, the bulk of my time these days is spent on the Saha project, which is supporting good governance in healthcare administration. And it is a project that is partnering with the Tunisian Ministry of Health and two Tunisian civil society organizations. And in some ways, it's kind of it's three projects in one, but it's looking at legal reform as one prong, learning and training as another, and digitalization of the medicinal supply chain in the third. And we have a really great team. There are five staff members in Tunis working 100% of the time on the project. And the project started actually before I came on board, but it really kicked off 
in in the past six months is when it's kind of really taken off. And that's been really exciting to be a part of. I'm learning a lot about healthcare, a lot about anti-corruption, a lot about Tunisia. And yeah, it's just been a privilege to to work and learn of, alongside this team. And now to Erica, as I know I teased it a, a bit a moment ago, but Erica is, uh, is a uniquely complicated role in the MENA team. And, and so I'd like to hear her describe a little bit about the work that she does as well. Yes. Thank you, Greg. It is a little bit tough to describe. I think everyone at SIPE has a hard time sometimes describing what they do, but especially when you wear a couple of different hats, it makes it even more complicated to explain. So I will do my best. I am a program associate on the Egypt portfolio specifically. So that's been really interesting, actually, because the Egypt team is based in Cairo, essentially. I am the only full-time DC Egypt portfolio member. So that relationship has been pretty unique because it's a lot of communication back and forth between DC and the field. The field office is longstanding, pretty robust, and you know self-sufficient. So that has been pretty cool to see as well because the Egypt programming is a well-oiled and well-functioning machine. And it's kind of become its own institution at site, I feel. Uh, with those projects, we do work on empowering private sector leaders. And I work very closely with Rhonda, who is the country director. She's wonderful. And as is everyone else who works in the Cairo field office. So that's one prong of what I do. And then the other is kind of wider MENA team-wide coordination. And I work closely with Greg and Steve and a lot of other senior members of the MENA team for a variety of things. If there's ever a helping hand that's needed with any projects, I'm kind of that that program associate that will help step in and fill any gaps as needed. For some of our region-wide projects, like we have a corrosive capital project that encompasses several different countries within the region and different sub-regional teams are involved, I help coordinate those projects. So I'm kind of used for a lot of ad hoc purposes, I would say, Greg, if that's fair. <laughs> so a little bit of a lot. Yeah. I don't think the word ad hoc does your role justice, but you you are asked to do a lot. Both of you, in fact, are asked to do a lot. The subject of the podcast, of course, is emerging leaders. So I want to talk a little bit about leadership for a moment. It's an open secret, certainly on the MENA team, if not at SIPE, that I'm a manager that tends to rely on my team to tell me what to do. So I want to know from the both of you, because I know that you've had a lot of experience with this over the last year or more, what you've learned so far in your time at SIPE about managing up and about leadership in general. I can start. I think I've learned that there's a lot of latitude on the MENA team, which is something really great. And it took me actually a while for that that latitude to click in my mind in terms of just having a lot of agency to fill gaps where you see the gaps and to raise things to supervisors or to you, Greg, or to just frankly go through and and solve things and implement certain things and organizational strategies yourself and kind of ask for forgiveness rather than permission a little bit in some instances, which I think is unique to this team. And that's actually a very good professional skill that I feel like is garnered here because you're able to be proactive, essentially. It's kind of like that blank check mentality where there are some gray areas with what we do and we're given the support and encouragement to, you know, mold those gray areas as we see fit and kind of just take initiative. And I think that that has been something that working on the MENA team has really taught me a lot about. I am sure that that has meant that occasionally it feels like I tossed you in the pool and said, teach yourself to swim. (laughs) Luckily, I'm a strong swimmer. (laughs) But that's exactly the environment that breeds innovation. SIPE at large has to work that way too, just because we're working in development. It's a question of trial and error on every project that we're working. Yeah, I would echo a lot of what Erica said, especially the parts about filling gaps. So I started during the pandemic. And I think with anyone that started during the pandemic, it's different from starting in person. And it it takes a little bit longer to, to figure out what the dynamic on a team is. But I feel really lucky in large part, actually, due to Erica. Erica was a huge resource for me when I started and played a huge role in helping me figure out what kind of a team Mina was and what kind of culture Sype has. And so, you know, with with that friendship and and help from her and others on the team, I I do feel empowered to speak up when I see gaps. I feel 
like I'm able to jump in. And when I see something that's not getting done, to either work on it myself or to, to bring it to the attention of someone who can. I'd like to piggyback off of Greg's question and uh, reflect on kind of your experience so far. So for new young professionals, what would your main nugget of advice be? Getting involved in different communities at site, whether it's the MENA team or the internship committee, the junior staff forum, uh, the community working group, establishing those relationships with people beyond just my my core team that I'm working with has taught me so much because everyone at this organization brings really valuable things to site and getting to learn from other people and getting plugged into those communities has been probably the single most valuable thing that I've learned here. So that would be my advice is to to find what is interesting to you, to find people that are similar but also different to you and to learn from them. That would be my piece of advice. Yeah, that's definitely something that SIPE is learning all together right now, the importance of learning from each other. Just recently, we held an internal learning expo with the different teams from all over the world having booths and and sharing the lessons learned with each other so that we can all improve together. Erica, that's a tough piece of advice to follow. (laughs) Indeed it is. I'll kind of I think Sarah's advice applies externally in connecting with others. And I think mine can kind of relate to just, you know, turning it inward a little bit. And I would say this is kind of three prongs, which I know we asked for one piece of advice, but I think it falls under the same umbrella. (laughs) I would say first, trust yourself. Um, I think as a young career professional, it's very easy to be very insecure, frankly, um, with, you know, how you orient yourself within an organization. There's a lot of doubt because there's not a lot of, you know, context for, you know, working in an international development organization. And what does that look like? And what can I say? Where can I insert myself? And there's all of these ways in which you can kind of impede your, you can get in your own way, essentially. And so just trusting yourself a little bit more, even when you don't know the answers to questions, when you don't know, you know, what paths forward look like, being your own advocate and trusting yourself, um, I think will just make the confusion a little bit more tolerable and it will make your life easier, especially as you're starting out in your career. And that's something that I'm continuously learning about myself and, and trying to challenge myself to do is to trust myself, put myself out there and be my own advocate, which I think, especially as you are younger, and again, earlier in your career, it's really important to just focus on those three things. Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to carry you through no matter where you are. Um, So that would be my advice. I think that's great advice. I think it's connected to what Sarah said a little while ago, also about filling in the gaps. I mean, not only just in terms of being able to speak up, or, or ask questions or insert your you know, thoughts or opinions into uh, the conversation, but also, as Sarah suggested, seeing those those things that that need doing and just picking them up and doing them. And I and I that's that's a quality that the two of you both uh, really bring in a very strong way to the to the MENA team. It really speaks to Sipe's expectation for us to go above and beyond. And personally, I, I find myself inspired to do so by the the local leaders on the ground. So my question would be, if you have, uh, Eric and Sarah, any particular role models that guide your path from personal experiences? You mentioned that your dad was a journalist. My parents are also in the press. I know that played a big role in, in how I approach my work. But it could also be, you know, Greg. <laughs> any of our colleagues at Stipe and like I said, on the ground in the regions that we're helping? The easy answer that comes to mind is my father. I feel like the work ethic that he puts in the level of care that he has shown for people and his projects throughout his career, that's been something that I've had my eye on since I was very young. And I'm really proud to be his daughter. And so I'm going to get emotional. Shout out to Sarah's dad who's listening right now. (laughs) (laughs) My dad has been, yeah, my dad has been a huge inspiration for me. On the opposite side of the coin, I would obviously just first, first person, most important person in my life is my mom. I was raised by a single mother. I've been really surrounded by strong women my entire life. Um, So my mom in particular, always shout out to her um, for being amazing. But I would also, um, I had a job in high school and in the early years of um, 
my time at college and I worked for actually a female business owner, small business owner. She owned a small boutique uh, called Cultivated, actually. If anyone's in the Westminster, Maryland area, I'll just plug it right now. I wasn't expecting to, but I will. You should definitely check it out. But I was really inspired and continue to be inspired by her. She just has such, her name's Tiambe, um, a diligent work um, ethic. And uh, it's just nice to see someone who has, you know, I always find entrepreneurs very inspiring because it's, there's a lot of risk in entrepreneurship. And you, again, going back to trusting yourself, you have to have a certain element of, of trust within yourself. And I think that being an entrepreneur kind of like epitomizes that trust. And especially as a woman, it's tough to step out on your own. Um, and so to see powerful women doing that, I think is always an inspiration for me. And I think um, I look to, to women entrepreneurs specifically who I've encountered in my life as inspiration and as role models. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure parents are going to appreciate a little public recognition for making us the strong women that we are today. Right now, there's a lot of examples of democracy being challenged across the globe, and it's impacting the people on the ground and their optimism for the future. How do you stay optimistic and how do you feel our work will contribute to the next five years to make sure that democracy stays strong? So there are really kind of scary things happening in the world right now when it comes to democracy, not just in the Middle East, North Africa, but globally. And I think the thing that that gets me up in the morning that makes me excited to do the work that I'm doing is that ultimately it comes down to the people that we are working with and for. I'm really, really inspired by so many of our partners, stakeholders in our projects our team, that's what gets me up in the morning is is getting to work with the people that we work with. I would agree, Sarah. Even, I mean, partners, field office colleagues, DC-based colleagues. I know just Sarah and I have actually become quite close friends while working at Site2. And so that, that makes the job rewarding. Um, you know, it's all about human connection goes a long way, I think, especially when um, like political, economic um, conditions are not very positive. I think coming back to that human connection and just feeling unified with um, your colleagues, with your partners, that everyone is still striving for that for that unified goal to better people's livelihoods, I think is something that will never cause me to be be uninspired. I think, you know, it's just that solidarity is what is able to keep me going. And just looking at things too brick by brick, a little change here, a little change there might not seem like much in the moment, but it does amount to something great. On a final note, I think the uh, an important message that I'm taking from our conversation today is the importance of networks. And I think that's an important message, particularly for Women's History Month and uh, any you know young women entering the workforce out there and listening today. It's so important, whether it's in your family, having your parents or in work, having supportive colleagues or even having partner organizations that, that inspire you to come to work every day, whether it's strong women or supportive men like our dads and, and Greg. <laughs> it's, it's so important to surround yourself with people who allow you to, to reach your full potential as a woman. Well, I, I just have really appreciated the opportunity to highlight uh, the, the MENA team and the MENA emerging leaders, in particular these two. We actually have a decent history of uh, junior staff in MENA who go on to do things that make me feel like a slacker. And I'm figuring that that's around the corner for both of these two just about any day now. In the meantime, I hope they'll stick around for quite some time to come um, because uh, talking about getting up out of bed every day, certainly working with these two uh, helps make each day a little bit more fun. Thanks, Zoe, for producing, uh, Zoe and Autumn for co-hosting, and uh, thanks to our listeners uh, for, for checking in with us uh, for this episode of the Emerging Leaders Series. We've enjoyed having you with us. And happy Women's History Month. Democracy That Delivers has been brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. For more information, please visit sipe.org.